Project Sin, Part 5, Tongue Tied. A mad king, huh? Wonder what's going to try and kill us next. Kelsa looked over to Liz, who was stretching out on one of the large recliners in the reception area of the Oceanside restaurant. The previous night proved one of the most challenging nights of their time in Project Sin. Here, the predators of society hunted one another for a chance at ascertaining pardon in the living world for their crimes against humanity. It was all kind of fun in a way. Exciting, she had thought to herself. Liz, have you allocated your points? Elizabeth shifted her attention from a small seafaring bobble. Allocated what? Kelsa made a motion to open her interface. Looks like I hit level 6. Liz looked at her quizzically. You need to allocate your points and check if there are any hidden spells. Pull up your interface. Liz made a similar motion opening her interface. Looks like I'm level 8. Kelsa looked over in disbelief. Wait, how are you a higher level than me? Liz didn't acknowledge the question as she continued pawing through the air. I do have spells on here. Let's see. Nurgle. The air grew cold as the words left her mouth, and Nail stood erect as if in some kind of trance. Black smoke began pouring from his every orifice. What did you do? Kelsa said, and as the words left her lips, the clouds surrounded them. She took a few steps to try and escape the darkness and hit her leg against something pointy. <laughs> Kelsa, you look ridiculous, she said with a chuckle. It's not funny, Liz. I, I really can't see. Nell gestured with his hand in front of him and the clouds of black dissipated. You are immune to the darkness, but your allies, I'm afraid, will suffer the same deprivation of my abilities. Nurgle, in my language, means darkness, so we could have guessed this result. Kelsa looked over to Liz, her leg throbbing. Could you warn me next time? Enavera. The golden glow of her summon's ability surrounded her leg and the pain eased itself. Esther leaped on top of the anchor that had punished Kelsa's shin and began cleaning himself. You all stink. Kelsa gave an indignant look. You're one to talk, furball. Esther grinned before leaping down and pouncing off. Liz opened her interface again and examined the list more closely. Looks like there's one more here, Sal- She was cut off by Nail, who had placed a hand to her lips. The pits of Saureth are home to some of the most resilient creatures of my realm. The air there eats away at the flesh slowly, and kills most lesser beings. I'm not sure what the spell does, but you shouldn't test it with those you do not intend to harm. She gave a nod of understanding and Nail removed his hand. This icon next to Nurgle, Nail said, pointing to a dropper means it's an ailment cast. Hence why everyone other than us were thrown in the darkness. Of course, there are others such as poison and invigoration variants, but overall, this is going to hinder your opponent in some way. This one, he said, pointing to the spell Sarath, bears the mark of an offense cast. This is intended to kill. The universal sign of death, the lovely bone seemed appropriate. Sorry, Kelsa, Liz said with a playful kind of remorse. Oh, look, subskills. Marksmanship. Oh, right. Kelsa quickly reopened her interface and looked for the subskills tab. What is it beside? It should be on your spell page. Kelsa's face went to a frown. I don't see it. Esther brushed past her leg. Well, you just don't have any yet. You should try learning a new skill. Kelsa looked down at him. What do you mean by skill? Like finding a weapon or something? Esther looked up at her, his eyes set in a deep purple. I don't know exactly, but my last partner carried a large sword around and got a lot of subskills and abilities with it. He could cut a boulder twice his size. Last partner? Kelsa said, her eyebrow raised. Well, yeah, although I haven't been summoned in a long time. If we win, I'm granted a wish and the option of becoming immortal. I want the ability to travel across all of the realms. His eyes shone with the light of bliss. Infinite discovery. So, what happened to him? A sense of dread washed over Kelsa, thinking of a powerful summoner being bested. He died, of course. It really was unfortunate. We were doing so well. A giant frog named Bishop Mountain coated him in some kind of jail that drained the life from him. He had a terrible habit of needing to prove himself and would leave me behind to go test his metal. By the time I found him, there were twenty giant tadpoles pulling away pieces of his flesh. So, what do you want, Nell? His eyes shone black. I want to be king, of course. To rule over all. Don't worry, Esther. 
I'm sure you'll make an excellent servant. I'll let you be an envoy, and that way you can travel to your heart's content. He smirked and turned back to Liz, who was pointing her lever action around the room and making sounds as if she were shooting it. A low hum and a small fanfare of some kind of strange instrument broke the moment, and the small devil appeared from before. Congratulations, Miss Lennon, Miss Rhodes. You have succeeded in completing your first hidden milestone. You will both be granted a reward based on your accomplishments. Please open your interfaces now. The two of them did as instructed and found that a list had appeared on the screen displaying their respective prizes. Hatchet of the Tarkat Mountain God. Kel suppressed the notification and a rustic-looking hatchet caked in rust materialized in front of her. She reached out to touch its head only to jerk her hand back as a small jolt of electricity stripped sensation from it. An excellent weapon, Miss Lennon. Liz looked over with a frown. Mine said magical magazine. It doesn't look any different to me, though. She pointed the rifle at the Devilman and pulled the trigger. The resulting blast decorated the back wall with remnants of the poor avatar in a golf ball-sized hole. Wow, now that has some kick. She had a large grin on her face. Better test it a few more times. Kelsa put her hand up pleadingly. Perhaps we could wait until we leave the building. Her ears felt as if someone had driven an ice pick into them, but hadn't resolved to finish the job. The Devilman avatar appeared just as they exited the building. Violence towards game representatives is not tolerated, Miss Rhodes. Liz smiled as she leveled the rifle once more. Whoopsie! Again, she fired a magnificent blast from the rifle. This time, the creature shifted to avoid the blast. You're going to re- Another shot was fired and the avatar was paced. Again. I have a feeling that's really going to come back and bite us in the ass later, Liz. Unfortunately, Liz didn't seem to be paying her much mind. Oh, look, I got two more levels! A gasp of disbelief escaped Kelsa's lips. You've got to be kidding me. Liz began distributing the points, but the smile she wore turned into a visage of pain. She fell to her knees and clutched her head. Once again, the devil man appeared. I believe you forget your place, Miss Rhodes. Liz buried her head into her knees, shouting desperate pleas for the pain to stop. I could have killed you here at the lab, Miss Rhodes, and tossed you out with the rest of the trash. I am God here, Miss Rhodes. It will be di- the Devil Man was interrupted mid-sentence as a hatchet was buried dead center in his head. I'm probably going to regret that. On the bright side, she leveled twice from a single kill and was granted the subskill Numanu Aggression, giving her a 2% boost to strength and dexterity when engaging in aggressive actions with a hatchet-type weapon, and the Radiant Spear skill. Again, the Devil had reappeared. But by the time the hatchet had been raised, she too was dropped to her knees in an ear-splitting pain. It was like the ice pick, but multiplied by 100. Miss Lennon, did you honestly believe that would help? Now look at the situation you put yourselves in. I'm going to have both your bodies expunged from the facility. I just wanted to make sure you experienced as much pain as possible before... Enough of this. A tentacle wrapped around the portly little devil and yanked it into a black pit. I'll see to you myself. The pain continued for a long 30 seconds before subsiding and leaving the two of them with a terrible headache. What happened? Liz said, a hand still cradling the side of her head. I shot that flying sausage again, but everything after that is pain. Kelsa looked up, wiping away the accumulated moisture from her face. And Avera, the golden warmth of the radiant magic eased their pain. Nail emerged from a dark pool forming along the ground. He won't be coming back, I assure you of this. The world seemed at peace once more. The waves could be heard crashing nearby and the sun began beating down on them. They decided to grab a drink at the desolate bar down the road. There were a couple of taps behind the bar with a fruity sour taste to it. You really don't hold your liquor well, do you? Nell appeared red-faced after only a single flagon. Shut up. Here, try this and I'll leave you alone. Liz pulled a green bottle from behind the bar and poured out a sinister-looking liquid. She took a swig, winced, and then poured a second one for Nell. Their eyes locked for a moment, and he threw back a glass. Almost instantly, Nell went flat. Told you, man has no hair on his chest. She poured one more and offered it to Kelsa, who had politely refused. 
She never really understood why adults liked to drink so much. Sure, she had taken a swig or two from the family's liquor cabinet, but it was more for the thrill. Esther found his way to the glass set aside for her and was lapping it up. Wow, this is pretty good! They were enjoying themselves throughout the evening until things took a turn for the worse once more. A bright flash enveloped the room and a man in a black suit sat next to her, a beer in his hand. He was well muscled, had gaunt features and a boxer's nose. He ran a comb through his dark hair while taking a swig. One of my moderators disappeared off the grid. He was supposed to be in the sector. Would you happen to know where he is? Kelsa looked around. Nell still slept from his indulgence. Esther was on his way to the floor as well, and Liz's face was flat on the counter, snoring loudly. Why did it have to be her? And why now? Uh, no, we haven't seen any moderators. The man chuckled. Strange, given he wasn't very far from here. You're the only players around for 20 kilometers. Oh, did I mention? We've been recording every single one of the inmates. So let's try this again. Where is my moderator? Damn it, why did she ever think that that would work? Of course these bastards have been recording. The whole point of this fucking thing was entertainment for those pompous pieces of trash back in reality. The man broke the glass in his hand and stood to a full height well over six feet. He grabbed the back of Liz's hair and yanked her into the air by it. The pain seemed to sober her up as she reached up, grabbing drunkenly at the man's arm. I won't ask again. Tell me where he was taken. Saurav, Liz had said, a bit of slur still tracing her voice. A deep scowl crossed his face. Where is that? I haven't heard a place like that on this world. Tarak. Nell's unconscious form stood erect behind the man. His mouth went wide and a green spear began forming in the front of him. It grew from the size of a grapefruit to about a two-foot diameter and shot forward. He turned just in time, dropping Liz to the ground and catching it, a faint black aura protecting his hand from the caustic orb. With some effort, he redirected it towards the back of the bar, where Esther had been laying. The ball exploded, sending fluid everywhere. Some of the liquid landed on Kelsa and immediately began eating away at her skin. The pain proved excruciating as she watched bits of her own muscle start exposing itself. Esther's shield saved him from the majority of the blast, but some of his fur still melted as remnants of the caustic liquid met it. Anavera, she cried, and the golden light surrounded them, mending some of the flesh and easing the agonizing pain. When Kelsa looked up once more, Liz struggled against the grip of the titan, but now his arm bled profusely, a fork protruding from it. Tentacles began whipping at the man's legs while another wrapped around the very same arm and constricted. Finally, the grip loosened and Liz fell to the floor attempting desperately to back away. His other appendages were bound now and Liz didn't miss the opportunity to put her marksmanship skill to use. She whipped around the counter grabbing the lever action and leveled it with his face. The ground began to shake ferociously as the shot pierced the air and the projectile went astray. All of them lost their footing as a large fissure began opening in the floor. My power is spent. Esther, do something. Esther looked to her summoner. Kelsa, the lightning spear. She began pulling herself up, only to fall to the quaking earth once more. A few moments later, the quake stopped and the mastermind stood, center arms folded across his chest. A rusted black and green armor replaced his suit, its pauldrons decorated with multiple triangular spikes. A large crest of a bear decorated the center of the plate. Do you really think any of you can truly hurt me? Last chance. Tell me where the moderator is, or I will fight you with the intention of ending your pathetic lives. A gun clap rang, and without so much as a blink, the man's hand was leveled with his face, his fist clenched. He opened it slowly, and the shot aimed to kill fell to the ground. I see. Well, might as well put on a show for the good people. You may have the first hit. I won't evade nor block your attack. Esther looked over to Kelsa and nodded. Raiden. Esther vanished into a haze of purple light, and Kelsa felt compelled to raise her hand to the side of her head as if to throw a javelin. She fought the sensation only to be forcefully snapped to it as a purple bolt of writhing energy enveloped her hand. She could feel the power coursing through her. It felt intoxicating. With a lunge forward, she threw the spear, 
Sinner mass and a bright flash of light enveloped the room. Their eyes adjusted to a man now standing exactly the same, but with a foot diameter hole running through him. The edges were black, and the inside appeared to have been cauterized from the intense heat of the strike. Esther materialized next to Kelsa, his purple gem embedded into the top of his head now radiating energy that slowly faded away. My turn. Each of them watched in horror as the gaping hole began fusing back together. An excellent hit. Didn't expect a radiant user, but that probably explains why my moderator couldn't deal with you. Seizing the opportunity, Kelsa attempted to strike again. Raiden! The now familiar sensation of her body willing itself took over, only this time things didn't go quite so well. His speed was unmatched. As she lunged forward to throw the energy, the man appeared from behind and clamped her wrist. The power arced through the both of them, but he didn't appear affected by it. Kelsa could feel it growing stronger, the energy becoming more and more unstable. This was going to be very, very bad. A bright light gave way, and the resultant explosion burned the area around them black. Kelsa lay face down on the ground, her eyes opened slowly to her right hand missing, and another quarter of it charred black. She wanted to scream, but the pain sent her back into darkness. She had lost. The titan folded his arms once more, the burn sustained from the small explosion healing almost instantly. That was quite an experience he said, turning to face Kelsa and Nell. Esther materialized and bit into the monster's leg. He flicked him clear across the room where he smashed into an array of bottles. Now then, shall I deal with you, Miss Rhodes? He said, turning his head to meet her gaze. Liz lifted the rifle, her entire body shaking. This is it, she thought. She was going to die here. Someone blindsided her to the ground and the sensation of falling overtook her. It went on for what seemed like forever. It was so dark. When next she opened her eyes, she was back in the bar, which was now a veritable pile of rubble. Kelsa lay on the ground, face buried into the floor. The burns ran a curious pattern along her body and seemed to emanate from her missing right hand. Esther lay close beside her, covered in broken shards of glass. His eyes had a distant look in them. The monster was gone for now but she knew they were still being watched. I hid us for a while. Seems we have some very powerful enemies, thanks to that thing you decided was target practice. Your ally has perished because of that decision. Liz felt tears creeping up on her. He was right, of course. Her poor little Kelsa was dead because she tested out her new toy. A whimper of pain that erupted into groans of anguish started from the floorboard. Liz dropped to a knee as her hand went to pull up her friend. Esther, can't you do something? Come on, Anavera! It doesn't work that way, Nell said. You can't cast someone else's spells, even in these circumstances. The attack he unleashed earlier seemed incredibly powerful, and he did it twice. He probably doesn't have the energy to do even the most basic initiate heal for his master. I was useless, Esther began. I, I give everything and I still failed. Why am I so weak? Why is everyone so much stronger? His voice was on the verge of tears. Why are you humans always so reckless? Liz looked away in shame. After a few hours, she had managed to get Kelsa to a spare room towards the back of the place. There was an old mattress and some linen, but it should be enough, at least for now. She needed to do something about the burns, but hadn't the slightest idea what. All she really could do was hope that Kelsa would survive the night. Neither of them managed to rest peacefully. Kelsa howled throughout the night, and Liz did all she could to comfort her. She pulled the glass from Esther, who began healing over fairly quickly once the foreign objects had been removed. When morning came, Esther glowed with a faint aura and some of Kelsa's burns began to heal. By the third night, Kelsa was finally able to sleep and was conscious enough to speak again. The glow healed the burns, but the pain of her missing hand never faded. Listen, Kelsa, I'm sorry. This is my fault. If I hadn't kept shooting that devil guy, we wouldn't have been in this mess. Kelsa smiled up at her. It was the first time she had seen it. I got a good hit in, too. When morning came, they slowly started towards the north. Eleven days passed uneventfully as the four of them walked along the coast. 
Thankfully, they scrounged plenty of rations from Maya, and Nell made a very convenient method of storing goods. He wasn't too happy about it, but a bit of coaxing got him on board. Esther didn't run off like he usually did. His demeanor had a much heavier atmosphere to it. Eventually, they came upon a desert-like landscape. It was a typical one, save the towering cityscape seen on the horizon and the orange-tinted mountains that loomed over the west. They continued on towards the city. It took another half a day to reach it. Its buildings rivaled that of a modern city, and the streets seemed to teem with life. No one paid much mind to them despite their appearance. They had of course found clothes in some of the abandoned apartments back in Maya, but scars and burns were not so easily hid. Healing magics only did so much. Walking along the streets, they saw many storefronts of a variety of clothing, jewelry, knickknacks, and novelties, and of course bars. Unfortunately, most of those stores were closing as night closed in, but the traffic of the city life seemed to be in full swing all the time. Standing amongst the crowds felt like... kinda aimless. What exactly were they doing here? Sure, they knew the rules of the competition, but what could they really do against monsters like Claude and whoever the hell that giant that damn near killed them? There was supposedly some kind of army of summoners that had started amassing here, and of children no less. What were children doing in a game of society's worst? Maybe they were more her age, young adults tried as mature enough to face the full consequences of their actions. And in any event, they needed to find somewhere to rest and make a game plan. Walking along the streets, they quickly found that the well-kept roads of one part of the city shifted to a more decrepit, unkept state. There was a night and day difference from each side. Passing by an alley, they saw people gathered around fire barrels warming their hands and an elderly woman pressing a large squirming sack under a bucket of water next to a faucet. She stopped after about a minute and started pulling dead rodents out of the sack and butchering them with expertise. She placed them on a small cutting board and would cut the head, tail, and feet off of the creature, then toss them into the very same bucket after emptying it. A small table was set up beside them where a young girl picked up the freshly cut rats and started dressing them, flaying them open and removing their insides and peeling back their fur. The older woman waved them over and beckoned them towards the door. Weary, they didn't refuse the offer, even if it did seem against their better judgment. They entered into a small kitchen where a middle-aged woman was cooking over a small camp stove. The dish was easily recognizable, the very same rats that were being cleaned. She smiled weakly to them, and they were led to a dining room by that young girl from before. Despite the outside of the place, the inside appeared well-maintained and orderly. Family photos hung about the walls and the warmth of the fire filled the room. Before long, plate upon plate came through the doorway and adorned the long table they were seated at. They were joined by all three women and an elderly man who came from upstairs. Ah, oh, yes, welcome. The meal was a quiet one. Kelsa had a very difficult time eating, knowing the meat came from a rodent. But Liz had no trouble popping the large pieces into her mouth. They had eaten their fill and sat with an eerie, awkward silence. It was broken by the old man. Please forgive the silence of my family and myself. We don't have company often, and I'm afraid the lack of conversation in daily life has led me to be quite drab. I'm Kelsa. She extended her hand towards the middle-aged woman that sat beside her. It was taken, but all that was said back was an indistinguishable squeak. I'm afraid here in the poor district, women have their tongues cut at twelve. She won't make very good conversation. Kelsa's hand went to her mouth. That's horrible. She looked over to the young girl who had squealed with delight as she hugged onto Esther. I'm not a plaything, you know. Esther tried to fight his way out, but the grip on it was too tight. Your cat can talk? That's pretty peculiar. What a world, huh? In all my seventy years, a talking cat. Each family member looked over with an expression of awe. Nell looked human enough. Scary, but human. I'm not a cat, I'm a carbuncle. The little girl let out a squeal. Don't be mad, Mr. Carbuncle. A look of terror crossed the old man's face. Maple! The girl quickly put a hand over her mouth as if to lock it in place. The old man moved as quickly as possible for his old body, and he peered out the window curtain. Damn, they're coming. Kelsa and Liz both looked at each other. Who's coming? 
Mabel's birthday was yesterday. If they do a bio scan, they'll remove her tongue. Listen, I want you to take her with you. This place isn't a life for anyone. I'm going to end this once and for all. For all of us. The middle-aged woman had begun to cry. He went up the stairs and came back with a strange-looking device. It had the body of a gun and a cylindrical cone on the end of it. Please, take my granddaughter and seek shelter. He placed it to Mabel's chest, squeezed, and a percussive hum was heard. Mabel lost her breath a moment. That will destroy the biochip so they can't track her. Take this and go. There's a place called Envious on the main district. Tell the barman, Al, that I sent you. Dear listeners, we have reached the end of this chapter of the Project Sin story, and it would seem another adventure is unfolding. The disparity between rich and poor brings along with it greater turmoil than simple luxuries. This city appears to hold more than one secret. Perhaps it all relates to this army of summoners? Option 1. Take Mabel and seek out Al at this envious... Option 2. Stay and fight the city's authority. Option 3. Abandon the family. They're strangers anyway. Let's write a story. Let's play a game without the dice.